This class is focusing on ethnography. Ethnography is a qualitative research method that has come to us from anthropology and is now key in sociology. It comes from two Greek words, ethnos and grapho. Ethnos meaning a culture, a group of people, a uh, society, grapho to write. So ethnography is writing about a group of people, a culture, a society. Its historical context really is related to numbers of fields. Uh, history is really at the first element of this. Historians began to write out what the king would have been saying, what the military would have been saying, what were elder statements, religious statements, and so on along the way. So history has a well-documented background in how we graph out what people are doing. Indeed, some of the great Greek philosophers were they're writing out whatever the philosopher would say. These were called the emumenesis is what they're called. But really they were secretaries or scribes who were writing out what the philosophers were saying. So even in historical research, we're getting this type of uh, activity. Well, sociologists and anthropologists challenged this historical view of research because you've heard the statement, history is written by the winners. So the historical research that we have is predominantly about people who won or are religious leaders. So we don't often have history of what we call the subaltern or the underclass. That gets obliterated. So histories are somewhat not truthful in its whole being. It has certain histories of winners, histories of religious leaders, philosophers, and so on. But it doesn't tell the whole story. Anthropologists uh, who brought ethnography as a field argued that what we needed was participant observers who would locate themselves in amongst a group of people, learn the language, learn the culture, learn the food ways for up to two and a half years before they started saying anything about those people. Because anthropologists realized that if you're studying some ancient tribe, for instance, that was still existing on some uh, island somewhere in the world, you had to make sure you understood the people from the ground, not just from a distance, because they may never have been written about. So we have this term, participant observation. So anthropologists brought us this idea of being participants within our society. The Chicago School, later on in its social research, said we have to get our students onto the streets. The laboratory of really knowing about people is the streets. It's not the classroom. So they challenged Park and Burgess and others for the students to go out and observe the changing neighborhoods in Chicago, the shock city of its time, where people from all around the world were immigrating and moving to that place. And that's where we got archetypes of things such as the homeless, the firefighter, the teacher, the sanitation worker, and even then the foodways, the religious practices, the songs, the festivals, what people did. That's what we found out through participant observation. So good ethnographers know we have to learn to get into our neighborhoods to study them. One of the strategies I've used with my sociology students is for you to go to your own neighborhood because going to your own neighborhood to study, which might seem boring at first because I'm so familiar with it, is actually a research strength because you're a key consultant to where you live. You understand it socially, culturally, physically, geographically. You know the good restaurants. You know where to eat. You know the good diner, the good bodega. You go to religious services, you know the neighborhood. You're the ideal type of person who already can participate and observe, participate and observe a neighborhood. So it's a really effective method, having sociologists actually participate observing in a neighborhood. Indeed, right now, I'm working uh, with Dr. Richard Semino and we're working on a book on diverse neighborhoods in Queens. And uh, we have participant observant students who are part of our project, 
who we send into different kind of parochial spaces, parochial meaning parish or small spaces, such as cafes, salons, churches, synagogues, mosques, parks, so on and so forth, to find out actually what the people are like. So anthropologists taught us the participant observation was critical for us to understand a people. Well, sociologists picked up on this, but they recognized that anthropologists weren't particularly interested in an answer to why do people do what they do. Anthropologists were documenting a people, much like historians documented facts that were written, and now we had anthropologists documenting a people, but not necessarily with some sort of other intent. Sociology, by its very nature, uh, asks us why do people do what they do. So we were very interested in how people function in these types of parochial spaces, such as synagogues, mosques, temples, diners, bodegas, ethnic restaurants, sidewalks, subways, and so on and so forth. It goes on and on. And it's fascinating to see the types of things you find out by trying to go after why do people do what they do. This has led to a whole track of research papers and academic books about different neighborhoods, different societies, different ways of being uh, that sociologists throughout its history from the 1880s and onwards have given us. Running side to side with that and sometimes counter to it are journalists. Because journalists also recognize that if we get a uh, writer onto the street, the beat reporter, wow, the puppies are fighting. They don't fight, do they? Puppies are supposed to be nice. Did you hear that squeal? Hmm. Journalists were interested uh, also in getting the buzz of what's going on with people. And so they sent out their street reporters, which led to news reports, led to documentary film, led to popular books, what, not ones necessarily that were academically verifiable, but were on interesting topics that people wanted to know about. And of course, the blogs we have these days and postings we have these days, any number of different journalists coming out, what's the latest thing going on with the people? So sociologists and journalists have picked up two elements of this. Well, where sociology has really uh, worked well with this is in journalistic writing. In other words, our papers and our academic books, several of them read like storybooks. It's telling a good story of the street. It has been able to make it interesting. It's not just a bunch of documentary facts. So a good ethnographer writes about the people and what the people do using a journalistic format. What then is an actual ethnographic research field that we could go to? Well, you could think of a culture. So I might be interested in looking, for instance, I'm Swedish, Swedish Estonian, from a refugee background, I might be interested in looking at refugees that are Estonian with Swedish background who have moved to New York City. There's not many of us, but there are some. You might have a culture of your own. When I lived in Long Island City, it was always interesting uh, seeing this group of Bengali people. Every Saturday night, they would take over one of the prime little viewing spots and bring all their little tasty food. I sometimes walking by on the walk, I'd say, I want to get some of that food because it smells really, really good. But they would meet there and celebrate with one, one another every Saturday night. Uh, I almost wanted to study it just for the pure joy they seem to have because they had the distinctive fashion styles, they had the food that you could smell, and of course they're speaking in Bengali. It's only about 20 minutes from there where the main taxi driver companies are. So it makes sense why they're meeting there at a special spot because they're not driving or their relatives are there and their husbands are driving or wives are driving somewhere. You might want to study a people group. 
like these Bengalis, or a Greek neighborhood, or a people group based on sexual orientation. But some choose a research field of a specific people group. What about micro worlds? These are really interesting. A micro world is in a large urban environment, how do people live in little spaces, small spaces, huge city, small spaces that look like a micro world. That, that actually is even more micro. Let me give you an example. One of my students uh, was very interested in the Guyanese community on uh, Lefferts Boulevard. There's the neighborhood uh, in South Queens. And uh, we're interested in having her look at micro worlds. Uh, and so she found an interesting one. On a certain intersection, there was like a Y where one road came in and two diverted off, sort of like this. And right there where you see my nail, in the middle of the intersection, there's asphalt all around it, was a little tiny New York special type of little park. Where what they do, they put a few little shrubs, they put a little bench, a few rocks, and then a traffic light. Very prototypical New York and it's crowded neighborhoods. People from suburban areas or rural areas, they wouldn't understand it. Somebody from New York, you get it. We have this space. We're going to make a park right here in the middle of the intersection. And so she noticed right in this little intersection were three gentlemen that uh, were Guyanese uh, that would sit on this bench every single day. So she uh, thought this was an interesting social phenomena, believing she was onto some micro world. So she began to chat with them and observe them. And uh, she discovered that there was really three men, but three places as well that they went. The numbers work. So these gentlemen had really three places they congregated all the way throughout the week. One of them was their church that was about a block away. The bodega restaurant across the street was on one of these corners. And the sports club that was on one of the other corners. And so they would meander between these three spaces and end up in the middle in this micro space all week long. Think about this. In the largest city in the United States, 18.5 million people in the tri-state, 8 million in the city itself, a vast collage of different micro worlds. How do people find people close to them in that little space in the intersection with three men and three places? So micro world is one sort of research field. What about social interactions? how people actually look or act to one another. One of my students uh, was very interested in looking at the face of the police with the face of his neighbors. In other words, how people actually look at one another when they pass on the street. Uh, he was a criminal justice student, so he was in interested perhaps long-term in being a member of the NYPD. And so he uh, looked at uh, this phenomenon in lower Flatbush of Brooklyn, of when police officers would come by, what would people do with their eyes and look at as far as when they're going by? His assumption was pretty open to see what he would see. This is what he saw. Police officer coming, person goes inside, avoids police officer, comes back outside. This phenomenon went on where they didn't even interact with the police. They avoided the police. So his paper was all about social interaction between the face of the police and yet they don't encounter one another. Until one day there was a shooting in his neighborhood and so he raced to the block where he heard the shooting was and they already have the crime tape all the way around the body that's lying in the middle of the intersection and he noticed a fascinating phenomenon. The police would go around asking, did you see anything? Did you see anything? You see anything? You see anything? People, what would you expect? Didn't see nothing. Didn't see nothing. Nah, didn't see nothing. Didn't see nothing. Did you see anything? No, I didn't see anything. So there's this interaction that nobody saw anything. 
And then he noticed the chatter, the background chatter. And it was a sort of a street lingo. Everybody knew who shot this guy. We suspect it was a gang shooting, but nobody wanted to talk to police nor disclose anything to the police. Why? Because now perhaps I could have the gang threat at me. So here was a paper that came about the face of the police, but it really became about what we call bystander apathy. I'm not going to get involved and diffusion of responsibility. I'm not going to say anything, even though I see a dead body right in front of me. So social interactions are a great way to study ethnographically. Symbols, icons, and meanings people place to them. Symbols might be a certain thing people wear, a certain thing they, uh, such as a necklace or piece of jewelry. Uh, it might be an action like shaking a hand, a uh, type of food way, or so on. But they have meaning and symbolic meaning to people. One of my students had a good paper on this. Let me explain this one. We call it the Sunday sauce. That's what the title of the paper was. And what Sunday sauce was about was her grandmother from Sicily, a certain village in Sicily, had a special Sunday sauce that all the grandkids, the kids, and all the relatives in the tri-state had to go to grandma's house for the Sunday sauce meal. Now, this was fun when she was a kid because everybody treats the kids well, right? Kind of like puppies. But she uh, got bored of this by the time she became a teenager. And by the time she was in college, she's like, oh, I got to give up a Sunday and go see grandma. Any of you ever felt like that? Oh, why do I have to do this? I got better things to do. I want to go to the beach. Why do I have to go to grandma's house? Because I have to do a research paper. Oh, research paper. Great idea, I told her. So what she did, she booked off a Saturday and a Sunday to go spend time with her grandma. Now there's a caveat here. And the caveat is this. The grandma doesn't speak a word of English. My student doesn't speak a word of Italian. And there's no mother in between to translate. So for the first time, she's gonna spend two days with her grandma and only be able to communicate in symbols and signs and in feeling. Of course, the grandma was so honored that her uh, granddaughter was gonna come and spend overnight. The other kids wouldn't do that. It's a good thing when a professor tells you to do these things because, yes, I love the elderly too. So she goes on the Saturday and then she was completely unaware that there was this whole series of food stores, Italian food stores, where the owners knew the name of grandma and her specific little ingredients, very specially chosen to put in the sauce. Then they cut up all the vegetables and then she had her in sequence, put them in a certain order. So on Sunday, they would cook it in the correct order, as it had been done in Sicily, in their village, for generations. The granddaughter is now learning the meanings of the Sunday sauce, the meanings of the ingredients that she had never thought about before. And then on Sunday, there's a whole strategy. They were up early and started frying the meats and the vegetables. Why? So that the whole house would fill with the aroma, that specific aroma. She'd always smelled grandma's house smells a certain way. She hadn't recognized that this was a cultural strategy of her grandmother to make the house feel like this and smell like this. And then to let the sauce simmers for three hours. The rest of the family arrives, they go to mass, and after mass they come back and have this Sunday sauce. And of course, now the granddaughter feels so much more special because she understands the meaning and the icons, not only of the Sunday Mass and being Italian, but also of the specific ingredients from her village, of her grandparents and her ancestors. And now, though she couldn't speak the language of Italian, she understood the language of Italian food, much more than just a good pasta. So we have symbols, icons, meanings. 
but with it, feelings, emotions, and attitudes people have. You could think of this in a neighborhood where people are frustrated because people are pushing them out. People are frustrated because rents are becoming too expensive. People are frustrated because of construction going on, frustrated because of healthcare. Any number of reasons and feelings, emotions, and meanings. These are important research fields. So we've seen a culture, a people group, micro worlds, social interactions, symbols, icons, meanings, and feelings and emotions are all critical elements of a solid research field for someone who is an ethnographer. We'll see you. Have a great day, everybody.